Ce qui se passe dans les bois est un véritable podcast sur la criminalité. Nous discutons d'événements qui sont souvent de nature violente. La discrétion de l'auditeur est conseillée. What Happens in the Woods is a true crime podcast. We discuss events that are often violent in nature. Listener's discretion is advised. DNA has quickly become an important and reliable piece of the puzzle when investigating crimes. There are reports on the news and online daily of cases being solved after DNA technology leads to a suspect. It's incredibly hard to deny that science is working and working well. We have quickly come to rely on it as the definitive proof of guilt or innocence. While technology is evolving, it isn't the answer to every investigator's hopes and dreams when attempting to solve a case. Sometimes the proof comes too late. And while you may know who the suspect in a crime is, DNA has yet to be able to confirm motive and give us the bigger picture into how a crime was committed. Join us for a discussion of a case that we wish DNA evidence could have given a better ending to in our second episode of the season. This is True Crime Podcast, What Happens in the Woods, with your host, Justin Bryce. Let's get started. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back. We've got our second episode this season for you. Hello, Bryce. Hello. How's it going? It's going. Is it going? It is. Yeah. It's going well. Yeah. yeah. So we're now officially in September, Yay. which means that we're a month away <laughs> from the stuff of my nightmares. What's that? Public speaking. Oh, I thought you were going to say Children of the Corn. Oh, I won't watch that. Absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> Absolutely not. No. No. I really scream is the only like scary movie franchise that I can get behind. Oh. I I I've never seen Freddy Krueger. I've never seen I nothing like that. Nightmare on Elm Street, uh Hellraiser, uh It. I saw the first It and that that was I'm good. I'm cool off that. I read the book. That was horrible. Um never seen Children in the Corn. Never seen, yeah. Ah. What, no, we're not watching no, it. I, <laughs> I've gone this long in my life. Uh, no. So I remember like me and my brother watching all those. Nightmare Mm-mm. on Elm Street, Friday the 13th. Mm-mm. Yeah, Hellraiser. Yeah. Well, Good there was stuff a, there. a Leprechaun one I didn't watch at one Leprechaun. point. Yeah, I don't know. I think we watched the first one. That was it. Yeah, I... I Mm -mm. I don't like being scared. No. No. It it doesn't thrill me in any way. It thrills me in a way that makes me want to punch you. Punch me? Everybody. Anybody who scares me. (laughs) Warning everyone. Don't scare Jessica. She may punch babies. I may punch babies, (laughs) kick dogs. Uh, Yeah. You never know. Does that mean we're not going to the haunted house this year? I don't do haunted houses. <laughs> I don't. When we have never gone to a haunted house together. Oh, no. No. What I we've been married how long now? Yeah. You should know this. So when have I been like, oh, we need to go to the haunted house this year? <laughs> All the time you say that. On my fucking to do list. Yeah. All the time. Never. Never have I said that. Of course. No. I love fall. I love the fall season. Mm-hmm. I love Halloween for the the eerie mystical aspect of things. Yeah. I am not into being scared. Okay. Absolutely not. If you love fall, did you get your uh, pumpkin spice latte? I have not had my oh. PSL latte. No. However, I did have PSL pancakes. Mm. Well, PS PS. Not, not the same. no latte there, but PS. Not the same. No, but they were Nothing fucking good. Like a nice coffee. 
Yeah. Pumpkin spice coffee. I on a fall winter morning. I really like the cold brew with the pumpkin foam. Yeah. Is that a thing? Am I remembering that correctly? I don't know. I I feel like that was really good. I liked that. Okay. They, or like cream pumpkin cream, sweet cream foam or something. Sure. Yeah. I don't know. There was there was it was cold and there was some foamy cream on it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I and it was pumpkin-y. Yeah. And the pumpkin loaf and oh I gotta, I gotta find where um, the pumpkin spice bread mix. We gotta stock up on that now again too. Okay. I think I'm down to two boxes. Oh no, it, that's a that's a real, real issue. Yeah, hard hitting issue here, yeah. people. It's almost fall season, and I only have two boxes of the pumpkin spice bread. No, yeah. yeah, that's not gonna suffice. It's not going to do it. Is anybody else out there a fall lover or is it just me? <laughs> I know it's not just me. <laughs> I know it's not. I know it's not no. Bryce, but no. yeah. And we're also a month away, essentially, from my birth month. Essentially. <laughs> essentially. Birth month, I forgot. Right. I, how do you forget that? I, I guess I try to block it. Whatever. It's the whole month. You act like I want just unreasonable things. I just want to be loved and adored as I deserve. Yeah, you are. Mm. Can't even have a birth month. The puppies adore you every day. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I have their uh, puppy confetti all over me. Yes. Sprinkled with love when I go to work. Mm -hmm. The hair everywhere. Yeah. It's part of the package, honey. It is. I don't mind. It's fine. That is absolutely fine. It's the slobber that I can't handle. That's your dog. <laughs> no, no. Buster Brown with his big old jowls. So uh, what's new with you? I don't know. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> what's new with me? So you ever had that feeling when like something comes back and it feels just right? I think I know what you're talking about, but yes. I don't think you do. Oh, what? So I know you're going to give me a weird look at first and most people we will also, but a podcast came back called Hot D. Hot D? Of course. And I heard the voices and everything was right with the world. On my way to work and everything. Uh-huh. It was amazing. I'm glad those guys are back. What, what's Hot D? House of the Dragon. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. That's the name of the podcast. Well, it wasn't at first. It was Electric Boogaloo, but um, they were on the first ones. Like they did the whole first series and like they talked about it, broke it down oh. and, and gave you histories and things like that. But now they're back with Hot D, House of the Dragon. Okay. I, I did think it was Game of Thrones related. Yeah. Okay. Until I said Hot D. Yeah. And then you said Hot D and I was like. Why are you listening to a podcast about dicks? No. That's no. really weird. Just hot D. You know, why is it I'm always the one whose mind is in the gutter? <laughs> I should tell you something, people. It sh it, I don't understand because it's not like I mean to. Mm -hmm. I don't. I am i don't have a filthy mind. Yeah. I, you said D. Yeah. I don't know. Just shout out okay. to the Hot D podcast. Awesome. I'm, I'm happy that they're back. Okay. I'm also happy about that the quote unquote Game of Thrones is back. Right. And the House of Dragon is back. Right. And it has not disappointed me anyway as of yet. So I mean, I think my expectations were low. Oh. I'm not really a, a fan. I'm like I'm a fan, but I'm not a fan. I'm mm -hmm. no, I'm not a fan. I'm not yeah. even gonna try. I'm not even gonna try to say I was a fan. No, you're a fan of the show. You like mm. you were you were vested. In the end, yeah, yeah, like the last two ish seasons, mm -hmm. yeah, the rest of it pretty much porn. Not really. I swear to God, mm -hmm. yeah. If I if I saw mind in the gutter thing again, no, it really. I'm I'm sorry. I can only watch so much, you know, naked parts mm -hmm. being like smacked together. I I just can't. Okay. 
I don't want to watch that all the time. Oh, yeah, it wasn't all the time. It felt like it. I swear to God, every time I walked into the room and you were watching it, somebody was naked. All right. I Maybe I just came at the opportune moments. You did. I'm <laughs> sure. I don't know, because I, I feel like I still was able to follow the storyline, even though I only watched like every fifth episode <laughs> yeah. in its entirety. So, so yeah. you can't really be a judge of it. Right. That's why I'm not even including myself as a fan. No. Oh. Because, I, like I said, I really only watched the last two seasons. Yeah. And there was, like, I missed the whole part where Jon Snow died. Oh, sorry. Spoiler. <laughs> Somebody hasn't watched. Good job, honey. Yeah. Well, you know, if they haven't seen it by now, they're not going to. Been how long? Maybe they were waiting for the prequel now and then no. watch the whole series. Who's doing that? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Tell us if you're doing that. Yeah. I don't know. No, I'm happy it's <laughs> back. It's 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 an amazing show. I love the the I'm not even like a royal fan, but just like like a royalty fan, but just like all the houses and the power plays and yeah. Yeah, there's a lot there. Yeah. I mean there there is a lot of complex storyline. Dynamics and yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. That's very interesting. I I am so far enjoying the show. Yes. Yes. But it's, I don't know. It, it It's not as big a deal for me. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I I just don't have, I'm going through a period where nothing to, I don't know. It's It sounds really depressing, but I don't. I'm not interested in anything mm -hmm. right now. I haven't really read a book in a while. I haven't, I don't know, I haven't made anything like crafted or, I don't know, it's weird. There's no shows that I'm really interested in. Although, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it wrong. Lock and key. Yeah. Yeah. That I do, we need to finish that. Okay. We're way behind on that. That's been out like two, three weeks now. Huh? Right? Sure. Yeah, we need to finish that this weekend. But uh, other than that, I really can't say that there's not even movies. Like, there's nothing really that I'm like, oh my God, I have to. Yeah. Yeah. Send me some suggestions of things that you guys think I'll like. Books or something. I need to find something. I need, I need some... I need a muse or something. I don't know. I need suggestions. Of what to do with my free time when I get it. <laughs> Maybe that's the problem. <laughs> yeah, that is the problem. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. All right. Well, I do have a case. Do we want to talk about that? Oh, yeah. So the case that we're going to talk about today is another great example of how cold cases are getting, you know, a new look with DNA and, and evidence. Mm-hmm. In this case, there is a match to a suspect that's based on DNA that was found on evidence at the crime scene. But even with that, the 1995 murder that I'm about to share with you remains to this day technically unsolved. It's kind of a, a sad case. Unsolved after DNA? Right. Okay. Okay. So... We're going to go to Olala, Washington. Okay. And Olala, for those who don't know, is a very small community in Kitsap County that was once a um, pretty big part of a trade route that was on Puget, um, Puget Sound. It was where a lot of um, European families, like from Scandinavia, those areas, went and... and really settled in when they came over and it ended up being a really good place for berries to grow. So it actually, Olala is a indigenous name for berry or berries. There's also kind of this weird thing that's happened on this, this area is, uh, and, it, and Olala itself would probably be very completely unknown if this hadn't happened but there was a some horrible crimes that happened there around the turn of the 1900s mm -hmm. when it was nicknamed uh, starvation heights 
Uh-huh. And you will probably recognize that name if you follow true crime in any way. Um, and that is a story I've been researching for a while now, but I I want to cover it. But sadly, today is not that day. So okay. we're talking about a different case. All right. So our case today takes us back to August in 1995 when a passerby along the 15,000 block of Peacock Hill Road came across a woman's body lying in a ditch by the road. The body was nude, completely nude, but partially covered by a floral patterned sleeping bag. When the sheriffs came to investigate, they found that the woman had been shot twice in her head behind her left ear. While there is no identification on the body, there was a varied assortment of evidence found around the body and then also about 50 yards away at kind of a separate location. Among the evidence collected at the scenes were several like pink foam hair rollers. And I know you know what exactly I'm talking yeah. about, right? Yeah. Um, it used to be what you could find in, you know, every woman's drawer is they had these pink foam hair rollers they hurt like a bitch to sleep in but you know if you wanted some curl you'd wet your hair you'd roll them up and you'd snap them into these little things so they find several of those and they also find like brush and debris that wouldn't normally have been found in the area and with that they found three cigarette butts According to Detective Mike Grant, the debris, quote, wasn't stuff you would normally find just growing along the shoulder of any road in Kitsap County, end quote. So it really stuck out. Whatever these like limbs or, you know, leaves, things like that, whatever it was, they don't describe it in anything that I read, but it was not natural vegetation for the area. So it, it definitely stood out where it was left near the body and in the other site that was just a few yards away. The other thing to note was that the clothing was nowhere around the scenes, either one of them, and there was never any clothing recovered. So it's unknown where that went. After the scene is processed, there is a total of 130 pieces of evidence cataloged associated with the investigation, which, so I had to think about that. 130 sounds like a lot, yeah. But in in the same regard, if you think of a crime scene, I'm sure that 130 pieces of evidence is is kind of nothing compared to, you know, some some pieces of like crime scenes where they catalog maybe 500 pieces of evidence. But to to number 1 not have any clothing. No. Number one or number two, no identification. She doesn't, there's no purse. There's nothing found around the scene of hers. Um, And you're just on the side of the road where really all they found was some cigarette, some, you know, used cigarette butts and vegetation. And then her with a sleeping bag, 130 pieces of evidence is quite a bit, actually. It's unfortunate that it doesn't really paint a picture of what happened to her. Days later, after an autopsy is completed, the Kitsap County Sheriff Department releases the identity of the woman uh, they found as 61-year-old Patricia Lorraine Barnes. And they figured out who she was for matching fingerprints that were on some file, record on file. Doesn't say whether it was because she had a history of arrest or... Mm. um, I don't really know why else she would have fingerprints on file somewhere, but... Maybe she was an educator? I don't know. Could be. I mean, maybe at some point an FBI background check was performed on her for sure. for something. There are many different reasons why you could have fingerprints on file somewhere. Yeah. It, it We automatically assume that it's because you are a criminal. I'm not, I'm not assuming that. Authorities release that the cause of death was multiple gunshot wounds to the head. And as you might have guessed, this incident is automatically ruled a homicide. Yeah. Now, I wish that I had a lot more to say about Patricia Barnes. But unfortunately, this is where the case is just very unfortunate. There is not much available about her. 
I did learn that she was born in uh, on November 20th in 1934. And then I was able to pull up some articles from newspapers at the time. They pretty much all say the same thing. Patricia was known as, quote, a, the towel lady of Pioneer Square in Seattle. The towel lady? The towel lady. Um, apparently, she was often prone to wearing like towels or bandanas around her head. Oh, okay. I thought she was walking around Pioneer Square in a towel. No, no. Um, so, and for those who don't know, Pioneer Square now, and I'm assuming in 1995 it was probably the same, is an area where there was a lot of homeless. So, you know, in that area, it's it's kind of an area you just don't go yeah. very often. Um there's a lot of cool things around there. There's a lot of really interesting looking buildings. There's I, I, there's a lot you can walk around and do. It's right in downtown. Yeah. Um, but it is a place that a lot of homeless people end up staying in, in this little square, this little park. Yeah. So at some point, not long before her murder, I'm not sure how far in advance this was, but she was displaced after her apartment burned down. And she was kind of bouncing back and forth between homeless shelters in the area. At 61 years old, I am sure that there is so much more to know about her. I'm sure that there is, you know, she had family that we know of later on as mentioned in articles. She lived a life, you know, she had years of a life. She might have had a spouse. She might have had children. Nothing of that is ma- like ever mentioned. Yeah. And it's just really sad that she's known by this nickname that she was given. And, you know, her state of residency in Seattle as a homeless person, essentially. Yeah. Well, it, that's sad. I find it very sad and, and very unfortunate. I mean, this is even in some of the more recent articles that I read from you know, updates, you would think at some point somebody would want to mention something about her other than she was homeless. She was, you know, known for wearing towels or bandanas around her hair in a a known area where homeless people are. And of course that she was murdered. So I, like I said, I wish that there was more that I could find. I just did not. So once her identity was released, authorities were able to get in contact with a witness um, who had come forward. And it is revealed that the last known person to see Patricia alive is this witness. Mm -hmm. So this man claims to have seen Patricia on Wednesday, August 23rd, in the company of a young white male who was known to be a part of a work release program. And he had been living in a facility in nearby Pioneer Square. The witness uh, wasn't sure how Patricia and this person knew each other. It really wasn't sure what the connection was there. And um, it, it wasn't known what happened exactly after they left, um, you know, where the witness was that saw them. She was found on Friday the 25th. So there's pretty much two whole days unaccounted for. Okay. The witness described the man as a 30 to 35 year old, um, about six foot tall with medium build uh, or was medium build and had strawberry blonde hair. And from the sound of it, the, the man who was the witness was speaking with both Patricia and the male When they told him they were going to go get lunch and eat at uh, Courthouse Park, and then they were going to head down to Federal Way to do what? Not sure. Uh, It's kind of possible. It sounded like the witness was trying to catch a ride with them for some reason, but that there wasn't room in the vehicle. Okay. The witness also inferred in one article that he was told um, that Patricia had either $300 in an uncashed check or in cash on her person at the time. And maybe this leads to motive, but I'm not really sure why it was mentioned. Authorities immediately released a a composite sketch of the man they named as a person of interest to the public. So this, you know, 
tall, medium build guy with the strawberry blonde hair is is pretty much the only named suspect. Okay. And they received no leads or tips from the sketch, unfortunately. There was also no real idea of, like I said, the motive for this killing. There wasn't any connection that anybody could come up with between this person and Patricia. They had no idea why she was out in Olala when she had no connection out there. There was nothing that they could figure out that she would be out there to do. Yeah. At one point, sometime after the murder occurred, they actually were, it was so far-fetched. They were looking at Robert Lee Yates as the possible killer, the yeah. Spokane serial killer. All the way out here. Yeah. <laughs> All the way out in Olala. Complete opposite ends of the uh, state. Yeah. I mean. But I think at that time, too, everyone was just trying to pin that on the, on him. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, that it, it's, I think at that point, it was right around that time when it was everything, you know, between, I don't know, early 90s to like that decade between like 1990 yeah. and, and the 2000s. It, it, it had to have been this, you know, a serial killer. It, had to, it was Ted Bundy. It was Gary Ridgway. It was Israel Keys. It was any anybody that had, you know, was a large you know, victim list. Body like, let me just say this name and maybe we can find something and make it stick. We've yeah. already got them for 40 something odd murders yeah. or crimes. Let's just tack this one on and we'll solve the case. Yeah. I, that's what it feels like because there's nothing that is similar for Patricia's murder yeah. to anything that happened to any of the victims for, you know, for Yates. There, there really isn't, other than the possibility of that first couple that he killed out in the woods, and they were shot. But then from there on, he went on to target sex workers. Yeah. And yes, they were shot, but they all had, like, bags. They were found with bags over their heads. It's oh, yeah. completely different. Not to say that it's not maybe plausible, but he... He would, I don't know why he would have been an Olala, is the thing. Okay. You know, it, that's where I'm like, well, really? Yates? Okay. They look into him. Um, and, and maybe just because they don't really have anything to go on, they're just throwing it out there. You never know what sticks. Yeah. There was also another possible suspect that was not named, but it seems to me, I read it in one article, and it seems to be actually the witness who gave them the description mm -hmm. and did the, you know, they did the composite sketch. They maybe looked into him as a possible suspect because he was technically the last person to see her alive yeah. other than the killer. Yeah. Regardless of, of what they were trying to do, despite huge efforts between Kitsap County and Seattle authorities, the murder of Patricia Barnes became a cold case for over 20 years until DNA evidence. So our, you know, good friend science <laughs> yeah. with the discovery of DNA uh, technology, you know, the advancement of, of the science and that evidence based looking at things. In 2018, Kitsap County sheriffs reopened this case along with 17 others in an effort to re-examine evidence and see if there was any potential for the use of DNA, you know, technology, science to help solve these cold cases. Eventually, investigators turned over pieces of evidence to Othram Labs for testing and they got a huge break. It wow. came in finding the person responsible for the death of Patricia Barnes. And we're going to go over what and who led to it right after this break. In 2018, after an attempt to solve older cases that had gone cold, Kitsap County Sheriff decided to send evidence from Patricia Barnes' case to a private DNA lab for genetic testing. If you remember, I mentioned that there were three cigarette butts found at the scene near where her body was found. Yep. So these cigarettes uh, kind of stood out to investigators at the time due to the other evidence they were found around, which was the, you know, the brush and leaves and whatever that were not natural. Were not natural yeah. yeah. 
However, there was, at that time, you know, there's really nothing they could do with them besides maybe try to lift fingerprints to match, but you got to have something on file to match it to. So if you don't have anything on file or, or you, you know, can't get the file that has a match, you're never going to find a match. There was, there was no, this was still the beginning of, you know, having a centralized system for anything. Yeah. It's 1995. There's, there's just nothing. So you got to have a person that these fingerprints match to. That's of no use to them. Yeah. So there was also the same DNA found on the sleeping bag that had been covering Patricia's body and on her body itself that matched the cigarette butts. To the detective working the case, it was just kind of a given that the DNA would lead to their suspected killer. Yeah. I mean, it, chances are, right? Which, by the way, at this point, uh, we know is not... Robert Yates. He was ruled out in 2020 as the killer after it was proven that he had been stationed in Fort Rucker um, in Alabama at the time of this murder. Oh, okay. So he was officially ruled out Phew. as a suspect, right? That was close. Yeah, I know. But the link to that suspect uh, came in 2021, the actual suspect. When DNA matched to a first or second cousin um, who would have matched to that DNA sample. So genealogy really came into play here. There were no matches in CODIS, but the genetic genome sequencing eventually gave up an identity. Uh oh. Yeah, I mean, they're going to get you. The sample would end up leading authorities to a repeat felon who had been living in Seattle and Tacoma area around the time of Patricia's murder. And that is a man by the name of Douglas Keith Crone who in 1995 would have been 33 years old. So okay. he uh, also fits the description. Strawberry, and Strawberry blonde. Strawberry blonde. Um, he definitely could at 33 years old fit the composite. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Composites are always a little... I know they do their best based off a description that somebody's giving them, yeah. but sometimes it just looks like you know, a 12 year old kid drawing some of this stuff. And I'm, I'm not talking shit about 12 year olds trying to draw. I'm yeah. just saying sometimes it really lacks depth, you know, when you're looking at yeah. a composite. Yeah. I don't know that I would have seen this man on the street and mm -hmm. had the composite and even having them in person and like looking now online at photos of the composite and him side by side. I wouldn't have placed him for it. Okay. I I just wouldn't have. But I some say it's a good likeness. Sure. So he actually uh, had five felony convictions for crimes in Washington, including uh, one for second degree kidnapping and one for first degree robbery. So he definitely had a very interesting past. Yeah. This was a great discovery, right? I mean, 20 years later, they're finding the man who's probably responsible. His mm -hmm. DNA is all over it. The connection to Patricia's killer was all but confirmed, and authorities were able to trace their suspect to an address in Arizona. It seemed as if the case was finally going to get, you know, some closure, and they would have somebody to convict. And that was until there was a little bit of a snag in bringing this man to justice. So unfortunately, what they learned was that Douglas Crone had died in a freak <laughs> electrocution accident. And I laugh because it really is a freak accident in 2016. Okay. So just two years before they reopened this case. Oh. He was electrocuted, apparently while attempting to place a TV antenna on top of his mobile home, and he touched the power line. So he was killed instantly. That's not a freak accident. That is a freak accident. That's fucking karma. I, sure. No, that's fucking karma. I mean, yeah, Eventually but 20 years keep, later? Yeah. I mean. He I, moved a couple of times. He was down in Arizona. His karma was around Washington, so it <laughs> followed him down it there. It followed it. took, okay, it'll it took 20 years. Yeah. I mean, I'm a firm believer that karma will get you. Yeah. And I guess the more you build up, the longer it takes, but it's going to hit you hard. Yeah. yeah, 20 years later. 20-something years later. Yeah. yeah. 
so yeah, he had a neighbor who was helping him put this on top of his mobile home and uh, the neighbor was injured seriously, but survived. He mm. was killed instantly. Yeah. Yeah. Karma's a bitch. Karma is a bitch. Do not fuck with her. Even with this disappointment, the team still pursued, confirming that Crone was the match to the DNA sample taken from the evidence. So at this point, they had the genetic probability mm. with the first and second cousin. Yeah. So they still had, you know, the the three cigarette butts and they had the DNA from the body in the sleeping bag, but they needed something to match it to. And what they were able to do was get blood samples from the, basically the postmortem examination. And that was able to be enough that they could find the match. So in January of 2022, the samples were compared. And in February of this year, it was confirmed that the DNA was a match to him. So this case is all but solved, right? It's close. It's so close. If they had just reopened the case a couple of years earlier. Yeah, but I don't, I don't know if the technology was there. I mean, in 2016? Maybe. It, I, I think it might have been. It mm-hmm. might have been. But I think it did take a long time. I was going to say, there may be a backlog because now everyone's like, oh, here you go. Right. Test this. And unfortunately, her case was probably not a high priority. No, I I don't think that this was. standing in the community. Right. People say that's not how it works. But yeah, if she was homeless, she was elderly, no family. That's probably not I mean, she, the top of their list. She has family, but I don't know how closely related. No, and like I'm I sure said. they weren't yeah. pushing for this either. They might not have. Yeah. Um, no. They might not have known. They maybe were, you know, really, th- it's it's just really the lack of information here on on what matters the most, which is her, Yeah. Is is frustrating. Yeah. Because her family may have been pushing for those things. I don't know. And and then again, like you said, I, they may not be. They I, may not have been. They left their 61-year-old relative on the street. I don't think they're really pushing or talking to her. Or maybe, maybe you know, I you're, don't know. you may be right. I don't, I don't know their dynamic. Right. Maybe she didn't want to go live with them. But I think any place is better than the street. I, I mean, yeah, it, especially knowing where she was. Yeah. That area is, is rough. Yeah. But... There may have been numerous reasons why she chose she didn't live with family or she chose not to live with family. Yeah. I, you know, maybe they were out of state and she didn't want to move out of state. You know, it kind of sounds like this was what she was expecting was that it was going to be temporary, that she was just kind of displaced yeah. through no fault of her own. Yeah. I, I, sorry, but if I was 61, I'd. I'd even move out of state just temporarily. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm i sure that there's a lot there that there's a lot that we don't know. And I would not presume to make assumptions, even just based off of where she was and where oh. she was living. I would hate to to think ill of somebody that I don't know, you know, or, or to presume the wrong thing. Yeah. But... You know, there's no mention in any of the articles that she had a drug addiction or an alcohol problem or that she had a gambling problem or, you know what I mean? There, There's just, there's no mention of anything that could have been a source of why she was yeah. homeless other than the fire that, you know, displaced her from her apartment. But that doesn't mean that there weren't concerns. Yeah. Doesn't mean there are, but... You know, in in the suspect's case, we know that he was in a work release program. Yeah, he had just time. been released after a, a felony. Yeah. Um, because I think the uh, the robbery was in 1984. So he oh, his robbery conviction. His robbery okay. conviction was 1984, and then after that was the kidnapping conviction. Okay. So. He obviously served some some time because he's had multiple felonies. Yeah. Um, it it I know what he was doing there. I'm not sure what she was doing there, and that that also you know is the problem here. I think of why this is so distressing is DNA is great at at telling you who to look at. Yes, 
But in this case, for her, there's no way of knowing what their connection was, what the motive was, and why he did what he did. Well, not now, yeah. Not now, because the only person who could know is him, and he died. So it's it also has, while you may be correct, this is karma, there is no true closure of a conviction. No. Of the case being actually considered solved, he's been convicted, he's going to pay for the crime in any way. He, I mean... He paid. He, he paid karma. Karma got him. Yeah, he paid. But, you know... The in, universe works in mysterious ways. Honey. It does. I Hey, I, who are you talking to? No. We, you know, I have crystals everywhere in this house, mm-hmm. and and we sage regularly. I'm, there are things that I don't presume to know, and I don't... Karma works how it works. No. Yeah. But I think it would be satisfying to know... What the fuck this was all about? Seance time. Yeah, I don't know that I want to do that. <laughs> Thank you very much. I I don't want the spirit of a convicted felon in my home. Okay. Not today. You just tell them you have a antenna to hang. Right. If you don't leave. <laughs> oh my god, you're horrible. You're Here you go. There Take you the go. metal rod outside. That's right. Better yet, is it a thunderstorm, thunder and lightning? Mm-hmm. Perfect timing. Yeah. I I don't know. I just, I feel like the family, what whatever family she has, this didn't really get answers or closure, you know? Yeah. But um, the detective I mentioned earlier, Mike Grant, had a working theory that after Patricia and Crone left where the witness saw them last, Patricia was killed In a location, of course, we don't know, um, and then transported out to Olala with, like, the random debris. Yeah. His theory is kind of um, that maybe she was in the bed of a truck. Like, maybe it was part of his work release that he was doing, like, yard work, like, you know, cleanup work. And that's where all the foliage came. That's where the foliage came. So, quote, Crone may have intentionally tried to confuse investigators to kind of slow the start, end quote. He elaborates by stating, quote, I would suspect that the homicide occurred elsewhere and she was brought to Kitsap County just to kind of confuse investigators and disassociate geographically with the victim and the suspect, yeah. which it, it really did. It did. You know, I but I don't know that he meant to do that. I think it was just let me get out of this area as far as I can, dump her. And, and I, I don't know that it was like, I'm going to outsmart the police. It was, I just got to find a place to dump the body. Yeah. And let me just drive. You know? I But think it may, maybe, I don't know. I don't know what kind of person he was. I mean, he was an idiot to try to put an antenna on top of his mobile home. Oh, yeah. So I don't know that he had the smarts to really be like, I'm going to outsmart you, copper. You know, no, he probably thought he got away with it. I mean, he really did. He he died getting away with it. So he thought. Well, like you said, the the karma has come around. Yes, the universe has answered. In his head, he went twenty three years. More than that, no twenty. Yeah, twenty twenty one years when he died, without any repercussions don't fuck with karma kids yeah yeah be kind be kind people i feel like karma really just takes it time it's time you know yeah especially if you're not in the area i think it travels it travels okay how does it travel by air by by energy oh it's got to follow your trail okay now you're the karma expert maybe it's just taking its sweet ass time Karma is not in a rush. I mean, I suppose. It got there when it needed to get there. You're very right. Yeah. Uh. So, yeah, unfortunately, this is an unofficially solved case. It's official, but unofficial. 
It's official they that they have a the, suspect. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I get it. It sucks, but you'll just you won't get answers from the from the gentleman's mouth. I can't even call him right. the gentleman. The you know from the the man, the man, the murderer's mouth. Yeah, yeah. It's not satisfying. It's not, but I mean, the silver lining is the advancements in DNA. They are right. working. They are catching people, and I think it's fucking amazing. No, I I do too. Yeah, and I I think even though, like I said, this is very sad because the closure is not complete there is still an answer yeah there's an answer you know, there's yeah. an answer and we just don't know and the they why. would have held him accountable if he were still oh, yeah. alive you know they they were doing everything they they could to to make that happen when they learned that he had died so they would have pursued it and, and i can't even convict a man no posthumously Nope. Hmm. Okay. No. So, yeah. That is uh, the case. The murder of Patricia Barnes. Oh. Yeah. I hate to even mention that she had that nickname because I, I just don't, I don't know, it's kind of derogatory, I think. The towel lady? Yeah, I don't like it. I just, I don't like it. <laughs> she just wore towels, that's it. <laughs> I know, but I I don't I don't like it in the connotation of you know her being referred to as as homeless living in Pioneer Square, and then she just had she's known as for having towels on her head. I just I don't like it. I don't know. Okay. I I don't know why it doesn't sit well with me. I can't explain it. it I just, don't know either. It it just like the baseball hat guy. You wouldn't have a problem with that, or. No, but you I also... That's what she wore, towels on her head. I mean, it is... The towel head lady. Right. I, I don't see it as derogatory. I, I Sorry. don't like it. I'm just, okay. I, I don't know. I don't like it. I I would think that there would be something better that she could be known by or, or something. It's some little nugget of information about her life other than... Where she lived and before she died, and that she had fucking towels on her head. Okay. In Pioneer Square, I just I don't know. I'm sorry, we all can't have the title of president or. That's know, not senator. what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, if that's the only thing that is referenced in all these articles is that you were homeless, you lived in Pioneer Square in between, you know, homeless shelters, and you wore towels or bandanas on your head. And you're 61 years old. Wouldn't you think that that's a disservice to you? But it was the truth. <laughs> okay. I'm not saying it's a lie. I, I'm not saying they're made it up. I'm saying that I it's... I don't... I don't know. I just... Um, I would hate it if that's all that was left for anybody to remember me by okay. after being murdered like that. Do better. The nickname itself is not a bad Even thing. You couldn't find much about her. So I, I, mean. I couldn't. I couldn't. <laughs> okay, but I'm not a journalist. Okay. I I don't have their resources. You're a home sleuth. Well, sometimes. I'm not wearing my shirt today that says I'm basically a detective. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a cool job? A basic detective? A, a, no, a private investigator. Like sure. a, yeah. Do that? Let's do it. I started a podcast for you. I'm not going to do the oh. the detective work, too. Well, boo-hoo. Yeah. You're no fun. Sorry. All right. All right, everyone. Well, that's all we got for you today. Thank you again for joining us. And don't forget to check out the uh, Pacific Northwest True Crime Fest that is coming up on October 8th and 9th. Yours truly and Bryce will be there. And... It's going to be a time. Don't forget the girls. Oh, and the girls. The girls are coming. Uncle Colin's coming. My mom is coming. Don't forget the girls. And the girls. <laughs> Mara and Olivia. Well, hopefully both of them yeah. will be there. We shall see as it is. And I I don't think we can bring a dog, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. I don't know if we want to bring a dog. <laughs> we could. We could bring a podcast puppy. We'll see. Yeah. Oh, we don't know the rules yet. We yeah, we don't. Them. We've just heard what our onboarding time is or what time we're presenting. But Yeah. Um, also, we should have a code up. 
So for yeah. 10% off, I think it's 10%, 10% off. off. 10% off tickets. Tickets, so, yeah. Um, we'll put up the code. Check out the website and social media. Yes. We'll have it for you. And a link of where to buy tickets. Yes. Yeah. It's getting close. Oh, God. Don't throw up. I don't want to throw up. I don't. And then you say that, and I think I might. You're fine. I hate you. All right, everybody. That wraps up this episode. We hope that you enjoyed it. Let us know your thoughts on social media or DM us. We appreciate appreciate it. As always, we want to say be kind, stay safe, and stay out of the woods. Stay out of the woods. Bye. Bye. What Happens in the Woods is an independent podcast and is managed and produced by Gospel for the Rebels, LLC. Research and content are presented by host Jessica, with all editing and producing done by your favorite resident techie, Bryce. We believe in transparency and will always list our sources and information in our episode notes. We are always looking for new cases and stories to tell. We welcome your interaction with us on Facebook and Instagram at WHIT Podcast and at Twitter, What Happens in the Woods, INT2. Or if you prefer, our website is whathappensinthewoods.com. The campfire is open to all. Thank you for your continued support of our podcast. If you love us and want to continue to hear us bring you episodes, Please share and like us wherever you can. But the best way to help us grow is to hit all five stars and review us on whatever platform you get your podcast fix. Until we meet again, campers, stay safe and stay out of the damn woods.